Okay, so today we're going to be talking about six questions you need to ask before publishing a journal article. My name is Jaleesa Doni and I'm the social sciences librarian here at the U of I, as well as the fund manager for the University of Idaho's Open Access Publishing Fund. So the six questions we're going to cover today are what publishing model should I pursue? How do I find a relevant journal? What can I expect from peer review? What are my submission requirements? What are my rights as an author? And how can I track the impact of my work? So let's talk about the different publishing models. We're gonna talk about three today, subscription or toll access journals, fully open access journals and hybrid open access journals. Subscription or toll open access journals are those that we tend to engage with most when we're doing research. These journals only publish articles that are available to subscribers. Individual readers or their institutions like the University of Idaho pay fees to access articles. So we as a library pay fees for you all as students, faculty or staff to access these articles. Usually authors are not required to pay any fees to publish in these journals, but sometimes journals charge page fees or fees if it's a print journal to maybe print graphs or charts in color. Some examples of the subscription costs of journals are the Advances in Space Research, which costs libraries $6,412 every year to pay for our readers and our users to have access to those articles. And then we have something like Applied Linguistics, which only costs $683. On average, subscription costs in the humanities were about $492, whereas in STEM disciplines, so science, technology, engineering, and math, they were on average $2,479 every year. So the cost to actually gain access to articles published in a subscription journal varies based on the discipline as well as who the publisher is. On the flip side, we have fully open access journals. These are journals that only publish open access articles. What this means is that every single article published in one of these journals is free for anyone anywhere to read immediately and in perpetuity, so forever. Some of these journals charge fees called article processing charges to actually publish the article, but some don't. These charges are often covered by the individual author or via grant funding or institutional funding. A list of the uh, a list of peer a list of open access journals that have been vetted and are peer reviewed is available in the directory of open access journals. And I'm going to share these slides with you after this presentation, so you all can have these links. But the directory of open access journals is a good place to go if you haven't encountered open access journals in your discipline and might want to publish in one of them. You can search by a title if you choose to, but if you just click search. Um, let's see, it used to let you run a blank search, but if you click search and then journals, you can scroll down and narrow down by subject. So you could see all of the open access journals that have been reviewed and vetted by the directory of open access journals in maybe the area of medicine. They sort the journals by added to directory of open access journals newest first, but you could also sort by title or relevance to the subject area. This gives you information when you click on these about who the publisher is, how much it costs to publish in that journal, and links to their peer review procedures and processes, as well as the journal's aims and scope. So the directory of open access journals is a good place to go if you have questions or are looking for open access journals in your discipline. The publishing charges uh, used by these journals vary just like, like subscription charges do. So Frontiers in Cell and Developmental Biology charge authors or their institutions $2,950 to publish open access in that journal, whereas a journal like College and Research Libraries charges nothing for authors to publish. So open access journals, instead of putting the cost of access onto the reader or onto the user, they are asking authors, their institutions, or their granting agencies to pay a one-time fee so everyone has access to this research being conducted. For fully open access journals, there are some funding options at the U of I. The first is the University of Idaho's Open Access Publishing Fund, which I manage. If you visit our library's website, 
you can get more information about the fund. It's linked to under services and open access publishing fund. You can apply from this page, get more information, as well as see the eligibility criteria and our guidelines. Another option for you as if you are graduate students is the U of I's Graduate and Professional Student Association's Publishing Award. This allows you to get up to $600 to publish uh, your work or up to $700 to publish your work uh, once per year. So visit either of these links to learn more about these funding options and to potentially apply if you meet those criteria. Next, we have hybrid open access journals. These are kind of in between the subscription journals and the fully open access because they publish articles that are available to subscribers and articles that are open access for readers. Individual authors are given the option to pay to publish their article open access. Those open access articles are free for anyone, anywhere to read at any time, but every other article published in that journal is only available for subscribers. Hybrid open access journals cost more in terms of their open access publishing charges. So Forest Ecology and Management charges $3,360 to publish open access. Nature charges approximately $11,200. We had to do a um, like a a, a conversion between um, one currency to USD. So that's why it's approximate. The Welcome Trust says that the median article processing charge for hybrid open access journals is $3,400. So publishing hybrid open access can be beneficial because you are making your research open access, but it's often more expensive and, your, and institutions or individual readers are still required to pay subscription fees to read every single article, every other article published in those news, in those journals. The University of Idaho's Open Access Publishing Fund does not uh, support articles published in hybrid open access journals. To qualify for the fund, you have to be publishing in a fully open access journal. Uh, but the U of I's GPSA Publishing Award may support publishing in a hybrid open access journal. So feel free to reach out to them if you have questions about that funding avenue and whether your journal uh, article would qualify if it is hybrid in nature. Do we have any questions about publishing models? Okay, so how do you find relevant journals? There's lots of different ways. Two of them are to start with your colleagues and then to look at online lists. So here at the U of I, we have a platform called Vivo that's available through the library's website that allows you to see the publishing and kind of research background of a variety of faculty, staff, and researchers on campus. So you can click on any of these individuals under faculty or search for a faculty member. So let's search for uh, Christopher Caudill, who's a faculty member in natural resources. And we can see a list of their publications. It's a great way looking at what other people in your discipline and in your area and research focus are publishing is a great way to identify journals that might be of interest to you. And then you can learn more about that journal by going to the publisher's website, reading their criteria, and potentially reading some of these articles to see if your research fits in with this journal scope. Other options are to view online lists that include maybe rankings of journals or just journals in different subject areas. The most frequently used list is probably journal citation reports, which is created and published by Web of Science. Journal citation reports organizes and ranks journals based on impact factor. Impact factor is a proxy for the relative impact of a journal within a discipline. Uh, it's, not, it's not like a one-to-one -one comparison in terms of impact factor, but it is a good proxy if you're looking for a rank, ranked list of journals. So let's visit journal citation reports and I'll show you how to generate a ranked list. You can visit journal citation reports from our library website as well. And let me just log in here. One thing to keep in mind about journal citation reports, see if I can type my password correctly. Nope. Okay, one more time. Ooh. 
Okay, got it that time. One thing to keep in mind about journal citation reports in all Web of Science products is that they do not include or they do not index every single journal that's published. They have a set list of journals that they use and that they index when they're doing these rankings. So when you visit journal citation reports, it's doing this weird thing where it has to load twice. I'm not sure why it's doing that. But once the page finishes loading, you could just search for the name of a journal and uh, see where it's ranked in a discipline. But you can also click browse journals. And they're trying to get me to learn all about uh, journal citation reports because this is kind of a newer version of the website. Then you can click filter and you can filter by category. So in journal citation reports, categories is kind of a subject area or a discipline. So you could say, show me a ranked list of journals, maybe in, let's do environmental sciences. So click the checkbox and then click apply. And you'll get a ranked list of journals with the first journal being the journal that has the highest impact factor or kind of the highest usage or prestige within a specific discipline. It's important to not focus so much on the numerical value of the journal impact factor. Uh, it's really more important just to look at the rankings, because if we see this top journal in environmental science, its impact factor is 38. If we go back to that kind of homepage for browse journals and remove our filter, let's remove environmental sciences and just get to that entire list, we'll see that the top impact factor journal if we can refresh this. Okay, not removing the filter. So what I was trying to demonstrate is that the top impact factor journal has an impact factor of like 100 and something because it's in medicine and those journals are used in a very different way. So if you're trying to generate a ranked list of journals to figure out where to publish, don't focus so much on the numerical value, just focused on the focus on the actual list in the ranking order because you wouldn't want to compare impact factor values in environmental sciences to medicine or to sociology. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison in that way. We can do something very similar with these other lists. We have the Simago journal rank, which lets you look at uh, articles uh, or look at journals based on uh, a different kind of ranking mechanism and different subject areas. And I've linked to something that's called the Web of Science Master Journal List Match Manuscript. If you create a free Web of Science account, uh, it lets you type in kind of your, once you log in, you can share like your abstract or a summary of your research, and it'll give you suggestions about journals that you might consider publishing in, kind of based on the content of your abstract. This little like service or program is a bit glitchy. I haven't been able to get it work to work on Chrome or Firefox and have had some success using uh, Microsoft Edge. Uh, so your results may vary if you try to use something like that. The last one I've linked to is Ulrich's Web Global Serials Directory. Uh, this is a list of like all of the journals kind of that are in publication now and that have ceased publication. Ulrich's Web is a great place if you want to maybe just search for the name of a journal, if you're trying to consider whether you want to publish there. And it will tell you if the journal is peer reviewed, it'll give you a brief summary of the journal and kind of tell you who the audience is for that journal. When you're trying to find a relevant journal, you might also consider visiting the publisher and journal websites where you can learn more about the journal scope and the actual audience. So for example, if we were to visit a website for the journal, let's try, we could do like Sociology Compass. We'll get a brief description of the journal kind of on that landing page. And then depending on the journal, you might see something that says about, and you can go to overview. There might be a page that says aims and scope. If you click on overview, you're gonna get more information. It's going to tell you a bit more about what to expect with this publication. And then if you get, click on something like contribute, page is taking a while to load, you can look at the author guidelines, which might give you more information about the intended audience for a specific journal. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more on our next slide. But something you can also do, um, and I would definitely encourage you to do so, is consider maybe reaching out to a journal editor and sharing your idea, sharing the title of your potential article and say, 
you know, is this something that fits the scope uh, and kind of aims of your journal? I've had good success doing that, reaching out to editors just for their opinion. Some editors might not respond, but having that contact with an editor can give you more information about whether you should pursue publishing your article in a specific journal. But you could also just go the direct submission route and not reach out to the editor and just submit through their online portal. So next we need to think about what are the submission requirements. Knowing and keeping track of these submission requirements for each journal you intend to submit to is a necessity, because if you miss some of these requirements, your article might get rejected. One of the main submission requirements that really isn't on this page is that most journals require you to assert and affirm that you have only submitted the article that you are sharing with them for potential publication to that single journal. They do not want you to submit your single article to the Journal of Climate Science and then the Journal of Climatology. You can only submit your article to one journal at one time. When you're looking at the submission requirements, you can also consider the content and tone of sample articles. So read through the abstracts of other articles published in those journals. Read the full text if you have access to that. Also look at the documents that are required to submit a, an article for publication. Consider whether you have to anonymize your article before you submit it. Consider the citation style and whether they require you to have an ORCID ID, which is a, uh, a unique identification number that lets you kind of keep track of your publications and people can identify you uh, from that number rather than just from your name. This is really helpful if your name changes or if you have a very uh, kind of general name that other people might share. So let's come back here to Sociology Compass and look at these author guidelines to see what they tell us. So they tell us about the submission and they say it will prompt authors to enter the ORCID ID to help distinguish their work from other researchers. So they're gonna want you if you're publishing in Sociology Compass to have an ORCID ID. It tells you a little bit more, maybe about how long it takes for you to get a decision on your article. Articles in this journal are published 12 to 16 weeks after they're accepted. You get information about the audience, the length of the article and scope. Some journals will limit you to a specific number of pages or a specific number of words. So check that before you maybe type something that's 10,000 words and the journal only lets you have 7,000. And then most aims and, or most author guidelines will tell you how to prepare the submission. It'll tell you the parts of the manuscript you need to include, such as how to structure the title page, how to identify who the authors, it, authors are, how to identify acknowledgements. It will tell you what to do with the main text file, which is the, the actual content of the article. In this case, we see that this journal uses double blind peer review. We're gonna talk about peer review on the next set of slides. But what that means is that the main text shouldn't have any information that might identify the authors. So not only should you avoid listing your names and your co-authors names within the text of the article, you also would need to make sure that the Word document itself is anonymized. To do that, I'm just going to open Microsoft Word. And I'm using, uh, I'm on a PC, but the process is similar on a Mac. So to anonymize a Word document, besides just saying, I'm not going to list my name in this document, you click File, and then you click Info. And you have to inspect the document because you see right here I'm listed as an author. If you click check for issues inspect document. It's going to run its little process It's asking me to save the document I'll just save it. Say test. So we'll go info check for issues inspect document. Keep everything checked and click inspect. Right here, we can see it says document properties and personal information. The following document information was found, including the list of the author. So if you're trying to anonymize your Word document before submission, click review, remove all, reinspect to make sure it's gone. And then you can see that I am no longer listed as an author. This is a necessary stage of anonymizing your document because anyone who then opens your Word document will be able to see you as an author. Or if they clicked into the properties of your document, they would see you as an author there as well. Also keep in mind what they want from the abstract. 
some articles want you to do a structure, structured abstract where you list uh, maybe the like a summary, the methods, the results, the conclusion and the limitations with kind of those headers. Some want something that's just completely narrative in form. It's very helpful when journals give you a kind of step-by-step -step or an example of a good abstract and a poorly uh, written title or abstract. Keep in mind what reference style you have to use. Uh, sometimes journals might reject your publication if you do not follow these guidelines. So make sure you do all of this correctly to the best of your ability. Um, and then just really scroll through to make sure you're not missing anything before you submit uh, your article for publication. Uh, the challenging thing is that sometimes you might write your article based on one journal's guidelines expecting to submit there you submit there and maybe your article is rejected and you don't want to don't want to or can't make the changes they suggest and you have to move to a different journal you might have to rework your publication to make it meet those other requirements whether it's citation style or just the way that the text is actually composed so trying to submit something for publication can take a bit more time than just writing your article from the start, you have to do some of this initial prep work. Okay, so now on to peer review. There's lots of different types. We have single blind and double blind, transparent, open, collaborative, results free. Most journals on their aims and scope or their about page should tell you the type of peer review that you're getting ready to pursue. So single blind peer review means the identity of the author is known by the peer reviewers, but the author doesn't know the re reviewer's identity. So if my colleague Jessica is reviewing my article, she would know my name and institutional affiliation, but I wouldn't know who she is. Double blind means that neither the reviewers nor the authors know each other's identity, only the editor does. Double blind peer review is kind of the gold standard in a lot of uh, academic or scientific or academic journals and scholarly publishing. Uh, double blind peer review is kind of upheld as a way to prevent potential bias on the part of reviewers, uh, either bias based on an author's institutional affiliation, uh, their, uh, their maybe perception on what an author's gender or gender identity is, what their sex is, what their racial or ethnic identity is. Since the reviewers nor the authors know who each other is, that is kind of upheld as a way to prevent that potential bias. Double blind peer review was not perfect, uh, but it's one of the most frequently used systems of peer review. Then we have transparent peer review. This means that the peer reviewers reports, so the details and maybe suggested changes that the reviewers submit to the editor that then get passed on to the author, as well as the author's responses in the editor's decisions le decision letters are published alongside the accepted article. But the peer review reports themselves might remain anonymous. So even though all of this information about the review process is shared, both with the author and potential readers, you might not know who the reviewers actually are. Peer review reports can be really interesting to read if you're publishing in a journal that utilizes those and makes them available because, because it can give you an idea of what reviewers are looking for. Next, we have open peer review. In open peer review, the identities of the author and the reviewers are known by all participants. So during the review process, I know who the reviewers are, they know, they know who I am, and then potential readers of those articles also know who the reviewers are. In these cases, sometimes they publish those peer review reports alongside the article too. Now we have collaborative peer review. I haven't seen this in practice, but it is something that exists with some publishers. It's where two or more reviewers either work together to submit a unified report, so they review an article in collaboration, or potentially reviewers collaborate with the author to improve the paper until it reaches a publishable standard. Collaborative peer review where reviewers are working and going back and forth with the author is something that journals use when they're trying to foster uh, research and kind of publishing expertise, maybe in new authors or recent, uh, recent students who've graduated with their degrees. 
Lastly, we have results-free peer review. This is a relatively new type of peer review, uh, and it's where editors and reviewers are blinded from the study's results during the initial stage of peer review. This is to prevent bias based on research that maybe didn't turn out how the authors expected or where the results were negative or didn't kind of meet what their expectations were. So there's two stages. The first stage is that the author submits their article but doesn't include the results or a discussion of the results. So the article is solely evaluated based on the lit review and the methods and kind of the research plan. If it's accepted after stage one, the reviewers and the editor review a complete article, the complete article to check that the results and conclusions are uh, kind of justifiable and that they match the research question and methodology. So this is a way to potentially prevent bias based on results or research that didn't exactly turn out as the authors expected. So lastly, if you are interested in becoming a peer reviewer, whether you're faculty, staff, or a um, current graduate student, there's lots of ways to do this. Um, I've linked to uh, some information on how to become a peer reviewer from these various publishers. All of this information is free, and it will step you through what it means and what the process looks like to be a peer reviewer. These links will give you information about how to approach editors or individuals who are affiliated with a journal to see if they're looking for peer reviewers and sometimes disciplines might send out calls for peer reviewers on their listservs or you might see something posted in a journal where an editor is calling for potential peer reviewers so if you're interested in being part of this side of the publishing process definitely look into this information uh, and consider becoming a peer reviewer it's a great experience to learn more about a journal publishing and to see that other side. It can help you become a better writer. Okay, on to question five. What are my rights as an author? We're going to talk about copyright, copyright transfer agreements, and sharing and self-archiving. So this is what are my rights as an author is kind of based on or starting at the point where you have something uh, written in a stable form, whether it's like written down in like maybe you're, you wrote your whole article by hand or it's typed in a Word document. This is kind of at that stage and then after your article is published. So copyright is automatic. It covers your work, whether you publish it or don't publish it, and it applies regardless of format. As the copyright owner, you have the exclusive right to reproduce, adapt, distribute, perform, or display a work publicly. However, when you publish in a journal, you often transfer that right to the journal and the publisher through something called a copyright transfer agreement. This transfers your copyright to another party. So here's an example of copyright transfer agreement that we can take a look at and see what these are. These agreements are legal documents that kind of change your rights as an author because you're giving these rights to the actual publisher. So this is from Sage Publications and it's for uh, the journal Crime and Delinquency. So it asks you to say, how did you create this work? It explains the transfer of copyright and what that means. It tells kind of the licenses that are granted. It talks about permissions and copy editing, credit, uh, financial disclosures, uh, termination of the agreement. What this is pretty much telling you in legalese is that you are giving your copyright, your ability to reproduce, adapt that article to the publisher. It's going to tell you how the publisher intends to use that work and what their rights are. Some copyright transfer agreements um, are very uh, I guess beneficial for the author and that maybe they're going to publish it and they have the sole right to publish it in this form, but you also have the right to publish it somewhere else or to use it in a course packet or to do something else with it. Some are very stringent and say that when you transfer this copyright, the publisher has the sole authority to do what they want with your article. They could publish it in an edited book and make money off of your article because you've transferred the copyright. So read through these in depth and make sure you read every single different kind of portion of this copyright transfer agreement before you sign over your rights, because there is some room for negotiation 
uh, if you want to do that. One source you can look at if you're interested in negotiating your copyright transfer agreement is Spark. And I'm just going to search Spark uh, copyright transfer agreement. Uh, Spark is I'm not sure what it stands for, but it's something related to scholarly publishing and, and research. Uh, but they tell you some information about author rights and they actually give you uh, access to an author addendum that allows you to start to negotiate with your publisher about uh, your rights as an author. So you can look at the US addendum or a Canadian addendum depending on kind of where you're publishing. Uh, these allow you to make changes uh, the publisher might not accept it, but it might be worth trying if you are concerned. If you're publishing in a fully open access journal, you often uh, get to retain your copyright and a different type of copyright uh, might be applied. Uh, and this is a Creative Commons license. You might have heard of these or seen these when you're looking at uh, articles. But Creative Commons license don't replace copyright. They just remove some of those very stringent restrictions on what other people can do with the articles you're publishing. Creative Commons licenses often still require um, people to who use your article to cite you and to attribute you, but it also gives you the option to tell people what else they can do with your article. Maybe you're okay with people uh, you know, adapting on your work and creating derivatives, but you don't want people to make money off of your article. Uh, you can create a Creative Commons license that allows you to specify that. And you can place this on any work that you create, um, even if you're not publishing it. And most open access journals uh, are using Creative Commons licenses to make the work they're publishing uh, more accessible and adaptable by others. So as an author, because you are transferring your copyright a lot of the time, you might uh, want to check with journals and publishers to see what they allow in terms of sharing and self-archiving. Journals might restrict uh, the type of article you can share based on the version of the article. So if it's the version that you submitted for publication, if it's the actual version that was published, they might have embargoes that say, hey, you can share this version of your article, but you have to wait 24 months uh, before, before you can do it legally. And they might tell you where you can share them. Can you email it to your colleagues? Can you post it in a disciplinary repository or a preprint server like archive? Can you use it in course packets? Visiting the journals and the publisher's websites will help you figure out what your rights are as an author. And if you have questions about what a specific journal would allow you to do, please reach out to the library, either at the reference desk, send me an email, um, chat with us, and we'd be happy to go through the journal or publisher websites with you and figure out what they allow. So for example, if we were to look at a specific journal, let's look at the we're going to look at forest ecology and management, which is an Elsevier journal. So if we come here to their website, the place to find this information about sharing is often the guide for authors. We can see they have information just like Sociology Compass about, you know, guidelines on how to publish, but you might want to look at something that says copyright or open access. If we click copyright, it says you have to submit a journal publishing agreement um, under author rights. So the authors have certain rights to reuse their work. So for more information, we can click there. And this page is going to step us through the different copyright restrictions that Elsevier applies to all of their journals. Uh, it's going to tell you if you publish in a subscription journal, these are the rights that you retain, as well as the rights you don't have. So if you publish in a subscription journal with Elsevier, you cannot publicly share the final published article. You could share a link to it or the DOI, but you cannot post a PDF version of that article that you download from Elsevier online for other people to use. And you do not retain your copyright. So knowing this ahead of time, before you choose where to publish, uh, is helpful because you don't wanna be surprised and be unable to do something with your article that you thought you would be able to. So you, we might see different 
uh, language used when talking about the version of the article you can share. And I'm just going to share a couple of these with you. So you might see something called the author's original manuscript, the submitted version, or the preprint. This is the version that has been submitted to a journal for peer review. It's before, it's what you, you know, submit in that online portal. Hasn't undergone peer review, nothing like that has happened to that version. Most journals allow you to kind of do whatever you want with the preprint and the submitted version because they haven't contributed anything to it yet. They might have an embargo saying you can't share it for a certain amount of time once the original or final version of the article is published, but most of the time you can do what you want with this version. Then we have the accepted manuscript. Sometimes it's called the accepted version or the postprint. This is the final author created version, and it often incorporates uh, comments from peer reviewers, and it's the version that was accepted for publication. This is in the middle ground between the version that you submitted for publication and the version that appears with like the correct typesetting and format on the website as the final published PDF. This version, the accepted manuscript, kind of sits in between that area. This version, publishers might say, yeah, you can post it on your institutional repository, but you have to link to the final published version. Or you can post it, but you can't post it for another year until the article has been published. Another version that we have is the proof. Uh, this is the version that might include kind of the copy edited manuscript. Um, it might be in the form of what it will look like in the final PDF, uh, but it's not, it might not have the correct like page numbers or some of the heading information. A lot of journals don't differentiate between the proof and the accepted manuscript, but this did appear on some of the publishers' websites I looked at. The last version is the version of record, the publisher version or the final published version. This is the publisher created version that's been peer reviewed and copy edited. It has all of the publisher uh, information on it, has pagination, um, and it's in the form that their published articles take unless you are publishing in an open access article, most publishers, or an open access journal, most publishers do not allow you to share this version, uh, share like the PDF version uh, with other people. They want people to come to the publisher and journal's website to get this version. So if you wanna share your version of record or the final published version of your article, definitely check with the publisher and the journal to see if that is okay. Because if you transferred your copyright and then do something that goes against what you signed, uh, you can get into trouble with the publisher or the journal. Okay, so the last question is how can I track the impact of my work? We can do this in three different ways. Uh, we can track the journal level impact, the article level impact, and author level impact. So we already talked about journal impact factor, which is used as a proxy for the relative importance of a journal within its field. What you could do is visit journal citation reports like we did before. And since maybe you, you had already published in a journal, you would know the title of the journal. So you could easily just search for that title. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna sign in again. We're not gonna do that whole password thing. But you could search for the name of the journal and it will tell you where it's ranked within the discipline. It'll tell you the impact factor and it'll say, like in this case, forest ecology and management is ranked maybe number nine in environmental sciences. So that's a way to see uh, kind of the relative prestige of the journal that you've published in. Some disciplines strongly encourage researchers to try to publish in like the top journals in their field, but in some fields, maybe that's less important. Maybe it's just more important to get your articles out there for other people to engage with. We have a similar uh, ranking, like I had talked about, the Simago Journal Rank, which measures uh, scientific influence of scholarly journals. You can look at where your journal is ranked there as well. Simago and Journal Impact Factor are two different ranking systems. So a journal might be ranked very highly in Simago, but less highly in journal citation reports. Then we have article level. So we have things like citation count. So how often has your article been cited? You can look at Web of Science, a library resource, and Google Scholar to see the number of times an article has been cited. 
Because Web of Science does not include every single journal, doesn't include that in its index, the number of citations to an article might look different in Web of Science than in Google Scholar. Jessica showed this in her first in the presentation last week. When you are on Google Scholar, you can just search for the name of an article. I'm going to search for one um, by uh, Kristen Haltner and Dilshani Sarasandra from the U of I. Uh, Climate change skepticism as a psychological coping strategy was published in 2018 and cited 28 times. So for an article that's only three years old, having 28 citations is really good. Uh, articles that are published more recently than that, like 2019 to now, might not have that many citations because it takes time to do research and build upon that research. So don't get too concerned if your article hasn't been cited. Uh, citation practices and disciplines differ. So an article might not be cited until it's been out in the field or out in kind of the research area for a few years. So don't get too concerned, uh, but this is just a way to track the impact of your article. And it's a quantitative metric that um, administrators really like because it's easy to see impact when you're looking at something like a number uh, for the number of citations. We also have a different type of measure called alt metrics. Alt metrics or alternative metrics are metrics and qualitative data that are complementary to those traditional citation based metrics. So they work in concert with the number of citations an article has received. Alt metrics look at the record of attention. So how much attention that article has generated, um, how much it has been disseminated within um, kind of the field or the discipline. And it's also used as an indicator of influence and impact. You can find alt metrics usually on individual article pages via the journal. It'll tell you what the alt metrics value is. And you can also download a bookmarklet, which will appear in your browser. So whenever you find an article, you can click that and it will tell you what the alt metrics value is. So if we visit the uh, publisher page for this climate change article and click on information, that's where Wiley puts it. We can see it has an altmetric score of 174. Nine news outlets covered it. One person blogged it. 144 people tweeted about it. It appeared on one Facebook page and there's 52 readers on Mendeley. If we click on this, it'll take us to the altmetric page for this article. It will show us kind of where um, the readership is of this article, kind of based on where the tweets are coming from. It'll tell us the attention scoring context. Um, so this is like number eight in terms of the 861 articles published in this journal that they've covered. Um, and it's number one of articles in a similar age published in this journal. So alt metrics are another way to kind of show the impact of your article because alt metrics are looking at things like number of tweets or um, whether it's been blogged or saved on Mendeley. You might get altmetric values way quicker than you would get citations. Slow down. Oh, just slow down a little bit. Oh, okay. So next we have H index. Uh, H index is a measure of the productivity and citation impacts of publications by a scientist or scholar. This is author level. So it will tell you and give you a value of your publications as a researcher. These are calculated. Uh, you can calculate them by hand, um, but I'm going to show you two different uh, areas we can visit to get these numbers. But it's a very simple calculation. You list all of your articles in descending order by times cited. And the value of H in the H index is equal to the number of articles in the list that have been cited at least H times. So I have my first article was cited 25 times. My second article was cited 14, and I'm listing these in descending order based on time cited. Um, I have an article cited 11 times, nine times, seven times, and five times. In this case, my H index would be five because this author has published at least five articles that have been cited five times. So one, two, three, four, five. You can calculate this yourself, or you can visit Web of Science Core Collection Author Search they will tell you what your H index is or Scopus author search. I'm going to visit Scopus because I don't have to log in to use that. 
we don't have access to the whole suite of services offered by Scopus, but you can search for author names and get their age index. So you can search, let's search for uh, Dalshani Sarasandra, who published that other article. And we can see that her age index is six. So she has six articles that have been cited at least six times. You can do this with any author uh, and find their H index. What you might also consider doing, and since I don't want to log into Web of Science, is if you search for yourself, if you had any publications, Web of Science might have a, an author record for you, and you can claim that author record and really tell Web of Science, yes, this is an ar article that I have published, or no, this isn't me. This is someone who has a similar name. So claiming your author record can help you uh, because it allows individuals to learn more about the research you're doing and for you to keep track of your impact. Google Scholar also has um, kind of author uh, pages. If you go under my profile, you can uh, log in and create an author page and claim your own citations uh, and claim the articles you've published. So that if you're searching for, let's see, climate change skepticism, um, you can click on any of these authors and you could see what else they've published. So this is a way you can create this yourself, get your own profile to keep track of what you're publishing so other people can see it too. Okay, so that's all that I had today. Uh, we have three more workshops. Uh, next week, we have web mapping for every discipline, how to use ArcGIS online. Uh, ArcGIS at first glance might not seem like something that is relevant to your discipline, but ArcGIS is something that everyone can and should use in their research. So please consider signing up for that. It's gonna be a great session. The same with data management. You might think, oh, I don't need, I'm not doing you know, research that requires me to collect all this data and it's not hard to manage. Data management will make your life so much easier. So please you know, sign up for and attend this workshop. Uh, starting data management and doing those practices before you begin your research will help you at the end when you're trying to get something published. And then on October 5th, uh, Jessica Martinez, who has been monitoring, monitoring chat, and I will be offering drop-in citation management help. So stop in uh, via Zoom or come in in person and ask us specific questions you have about citation management and citation managers. We're happy to help. Yes. Um, there's a question. Trying to log into Altmetric. I was trying to use Altmetric and it said that it can't find you idaho.edu as an organization. Do you have any tips for logging in? Yes, so we don't have uh, the question, I'm just going to repeat it for the recording, uh, was about logging into Altmetrics. Um, we don't have institutional access to Altmetrics. We do not pay for that. Uh, the bookmarklet should be free. It will ask you to share your email address and they send you periodic updates. Uh, but our institution doesn't have institutional access to Altmetrics. Okay, well, thank you everyone for attending. Jessica is going to share a a survey with the Zoom participants. So please complete that and share your feedback. Uh, we will also share the slides and a copy of the recording once it's available on YouTube to everyone who attended and everyone who registered. So thank you all so much.